Okay, uh, first, thanks uh, for the invitation here. I'm not directly working in epigenomics, and uh, this is very educational for me. So I'm going to describe uh, very quickly uh, a tool called the Integrative Genomics Viewer. First, I'll give a, just an overview of what it's all about, and I want to spend, whoops, about half the time on uh, just mentioning things that we're doing right now. Some release, some not. Uh, right. So first of all, what is it? it it's a desktop application um, for a visual exploration of genomic data sets. Um, by desktop, I mean it's an application that runs on your computer and there's uh, no website directly involved. It's been used for a, in a variety of fields, some of which are represented here. So what can you do with it? As I said, you can uh, it's essentially, at one level, a genome browser. Uh, you can integrate multiple data types. Uh, I'm, in, uh, I'm actually in the cancer program at the Broad, so clinical information is very important. So we, we have uh, support for overlaying clinical data on, on, uh, on all our track types. Uh, and uh, you can visualize data locally, which is the focus of IGV, uh, but also remote sources. So what's IGV not good at, uh, good for? Uh, it's really not a tool for primary data analysis. Uh, you should do that elsewhere. It takes a very long time to pan across the genome looking for things. Um, it's really, uh, I guess the primary use that I see anyway is, is visualizing results that you have computed elsewhere for confirmation and validation. Uh, it's also not the best tool for browsing the large repositories such as UCSC or uh, Epigenome Roadmap. For that, I direct you to the Epigenome Browser, which you'll learn about next. So what can you visualize? Uh, I start with a uh, copy number, not that it's of great interest here, but because this is where IGV itself started. This is microarray data. Uh, red represents amplification, blue deletion, and this is like from IGV even before 1.0. ChipSeq, um, this paper referenced, uh, it was actually, I, is what drug IGV into epigenetics, was a visualizer for the data for this paper. Uh, it's rather old now, 2008. At that time, these colors were decided as well, and I believe they have stuck for, uh, at least at the road, for the K4 trimethylation and the green for the activation, red for the um, repressive marks. That's a link RNA at the bottom from the paper. And finally, uh, some years later, maybe, I don't know, three years, three or four years later, um, whole genome sequence alignments came to IGV, and this is probably the primary use, overwhelming use of IGV at this time, based on citations that I see. And the impetus for this was the Thousand Genomes Project. So the view here is of uh, alignments and coverage from a single sample. Um, mostly in these views in IGV, everything is gray. Gray generally means that it's an expected result. It matches the reference. Bases that don't match the reference will be highlighted by a color, as shown there. Also, the coverage track itself, even when you're zoomed out too far to see individual bases, will indicate to you where there is a larger than expected number of mismatches at a location. So the, you can think of this, these colors as representing putative SNPs. But please use a proper SNP color. This is just basic counts. Um, so SNPs is a big, uh, obviously uh, mutations and SNPs are, are what most people use IGV for, but it also understands paired-in alignments 
the expected orientations, the expected insert sizes, and there's various colors to, uh, to flag different events. This is flagging an in inversion. It takes a very long time to explain how this works, so take my word for it. Um, this is uh, from a thousand genome sample. Uh, RNA-seq is sort of the same, but has a different look because of all the splicing going on. This is uh, heart liver from body map data. I zoom in on, of course, one thing you can see in RNA, you can't see in DNA, is alternative splicing, which is illustrated here uh, between these two samples. And finally, bisulfite sequencing, which um, I'm sure is of interest to some here. Uh, IGV has a special coloring mode, which you can switch on, which will s understands the C to T business and that, this, that you don't have a zillion snips here, that this <laughs> actually means something else. And what you see in the red and blue, these are individual base uh, uh, information. It's not a call. This is the raw data of where a C or a T was expected or not and so forth. And it also understands you can set it for different contexts, not just CG, if you're dealing with plants or something weird. File formats, I'm not gonna go through all these. Um, the many file formats are supported. If your file format is not on the list, I apologize. See me later and we'll see about adding it. But I believe uh, virtually all the formats used for the uh, epigenome roadmap are represented here in the encode. Yeah, a note on file formats. Um, um, much of the data we deal with now is actually very large files, and for those there are special formats which uh, please use them. You'll be much happier. Uh, in particular, BAM, Big Bed, Big Wig are excellent for small files or large files. Uh, plain bed and wig, not so good. There are tools that can index bed files, um, but that's just a, a note of caution. I, I get many emails about, uh, I'm using 20 gigabytes and I'm still running out of memory and almost always someone's loading a, a wig file of, that's, uh, you know, 100 gigabytes or something ridiculous. Uh, data sources, so again, IGVs, it's really, it's, it's really geared towards the data producer looking at their own files, but uh, often you don't want to look at your data in a vacuum, so we can pull data from various places. Um, uh, for example, the 1,000 genomes, all the BAMs are available through a menu in IGV, which it gets from Amazon. I think I talked to Paul, asked him about this years ago, when will it be there, and uh, well, it's finally there, so now you can load it. Um, ENCODE is another, another one which I'm going to demonstrate shortly. And uh, also various portals, mostly web portals from the Broad for small projects. You can get data. Um, here's an example, one that might be of interest, chromatin regulators. From this website, you can launch IGV and the data will be loaded uh, automatically. Link RNAs as well. Uh, even if you don't believe in or are working on link RNAs, you can get access to all the body map um, alignments this way. Okay, so that's it for the overview. There are many things I didn't cover. Uh, BCF variant calls and 1,000 genomes, for example. But I want to just touch on some new features in case there are IGV users here, uh, just to uh, alert you to some things that are available now. One is an ENCODE loader or browser. And uh, for this one, I'm going to try to figure out, this is actually a movie, but I don't have a mouse. So is there a keyboard? This is a movie, if, oh, back one. Yes, uh, there, okay, so what I'm, I've just opened the ENCODE browser, so to speak, 
there's 19,000 files. As I type in filters, they're getting reduced further and further. Um, so now we're down to 11 rows, and it's the 11 that I wanted for this example. I'm going to pick a few. There's a peak, big wig, and bam represented there. Eh, some delay. <laughs> okay. So now we'll jump to a gene. More delay. Uh, there we go. It, okay, so that's it. Um, so what we have here actually is the, it's like uh, the peak, the highest level data is at the top, the peak call, which was based on this wiggle track in the middle, which in turn is based on the alignment tracks at the bottom. That wasn't the point though. Uh, the point was just to show you the encode loader and how it works. Um, this is in the early access IGV. If you're an IGV user, it'll, it'll be released next week. Um, and um, I kind of like it. it. That's all you're ever going to have. You're not going to have a table with a grid or anything because I don't have time to do that. But this works pretty well. And I think, uh, well, I'm open to input. Uh, please send me your comments. Uh, the next new feature, um, I said IGV is not for primary analysis. However, sometimes you just want to ask simple questions about something you're looking at. So we've started to add a few um, quick running, uh, helpful, uh, lightweight analyses. Um, a key point of, the, of what I'm about to show you is that um, in every case, the computation being done is only on what's in view. So it's not on the entire file or the entire genome, and this is how we keep it fast. If you move somewhere else, then the computations are redone. So you have the illusion of a, a huge track that covers the genome, but that's not what you have. You just have these little snippets. And uh, the first one we did was we integrate bed tools, which is probably very familiar to some of you. It's, uh, it's a set of utilities for basically doing set sort of arithmetic on uh, on genomic features. Here's some example questions that you might ask with bed tools. So I didn't want to use those because this is epigenetics, so I, I, I come up with another one, which is, uh, let's say we want to find promoters in some region that are bivalent with active and repressive marks. So to set it up, I've loaded uh, K4 trimethylation, K27, and a track of transcription start sites. The way this works is fairly straightforward. I run bed tools. I'll run the intersect uh, uh, calculation. I choose my two peaks, and I get a new track, which is the intersection of the K4 and K27. That's good. That's not quite what I want, because I want bivalent promoters. So you can actually run a bed tools computation on a previous computation. So we'll intersect um, our um, putative bivalent sites, say, with the transcription start site track. And now we have a, a much more manageable uh, number, still a fairly large number of regions to check out. If we zoom in on one, we'll see what we expected to see. Again, I want to uh, just uh, re-emphasize that this is fast because we're only doing it on a small region. Uh, another one we've added is called Motif Finder. It should be called probably Region Finder. It doesn't actually find motifs. You tell it motifs. It finds locations in the genome where they occur. And the input can be regular expression or IUPAC codes. We're considering uh, allowing you to input the matrices. Uh, I forgot what they're called, a format, but that's a little more complicated, especially from the UI. So uh, for example, uh, let's find where the Tata binding protein binds to Tata. So for this, uh, to set this up, I have a few uh, chromatin mark tracks, which are irrelevant, actually, and the uh, TBP track is in the light blue at the bottom. 
So the first step, I'll type in my motif, and it finds them, and there's actually quite a few. Blue and the red are, represent strand. But I'm interested in uh, only where uh, TBP peaks intersect the peak, and then when I do that, I only find three. So this illustrates really more what we're after. It's kind of finding needles in the haystack quickly. I zoom in on one and confirm that my motif is there. Um, and the last topic uh, in new stuff, some of it's not so new, is multi-region views. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, the things you're looking at aren't right together on the genome, or maybe uh, most of the genome was noise, like if you're only interested in exons, then 95% of what you see in IGV will be of no interest. So that's where uh, multi-region views come in. And our first shot at this was a geneless view created for cancer informatics, and I, th I think Ting also has something almost exactly like this. Um, and that's been very useful. Uh, in the past year, we've introduced an exome view for all the RNA people at the Broad. And finally, what we're working on now is sort of a combination of the two, which is called cursors, which I'll explain the, the why uh, shortly. So gene, geneless view is, again, it's for listed genes, although it can be any kind of generic region. Um, the display is divided into equal size frames. You can sort samples, uh, which you can generally do in IGV for any view, but not the frames. And the practical limit of it, because of the way it's implemented, is about 200 loci. And here's an example, uh, again, with cancer data, copy number. In this example, I've sorted uh, the samples by the copy number in the indicated row. And maybe I, maybe I can imagine a correlation between those two genes. Um, but that's the sort of an, uh, main use of this view, is, is sorting and looking for correlations. Here's one that's clearer. I sorted by the uh, MDM2 copy number, and I find that it's mutually exclusive with the mutations of TP53 in this data set. So the exome view, in some ways, it's similar because it's regions, but in other ways, it's different. So the, the regions are defined in this view by an annotation track, usually uh, a gene track with exons, although as a user, you can tell it which track to use, which can be one that you loaded. So in that, that sense, it's an exome view because you can define the ohm. For example, I could load a track of enhancers and say, this is my ohm now. It'll cut everything out that is not in the specified track. Regions stay in fixed genomic order. They can't be rearranged. And uh, unlike the gene list view where all the regions have to fit in the window, with the exome view, you can pan across the genome. The compromise is you can't zoom out too far. Um, it just becomes unwieldy. Uh, performance becomes bad. So this is more for zoomed-in views. Uh, here's an example. So here's some RNA data. I hit the exome button there, and the introns go away. Very good. So what is cursor? Um, the working title is cursor. It uh, stands for current set of regions. Um, Unlike the gene list view, it's, it supports an arbitrarily large number of loci. You can pan and zoom at all resolutions. Um, again, when sorting of sampling is a given, but in this, uh, in this mode, you can also sort the frames, the regions. I should say, I should have had on the slide, so, how do, so what's the catch? The catch is this view only works for high-level tracks like peak calls. This view really doesn't work. It's not for big wigs and definitely not for BAMs. So um, that's how we get away with this. Here's an here's a example. Um, in this case, I've loaded again my two favorite marks, um, a track of um, bivalent sites computed as earlier, and some genes. 
Uh, now this is genomic view, the standard view. Now I've specified the uh, transcrip transcription start sites as my uh, list of loci, so everything that's not a transcription start site now is removed from the view. There's a thousand of them here that if you only have a few, it'll draw lines between them, but if they occupy less than five pixels width, it takes the lines away because it would overwhelm the view. And the new thing you can do that you couldn't do before is sort the region. So I'm going to sort by K4 trimethylation signal. Now the frames are rearranged that way and a, a pattern emerged that's probably neither important nor surprising, but the bivalent genes are sort of to the right at where the K4 trimethylation is somewhat lower. The very highest K4 peaks have no bivalent sites. So um, I maybe have talked fast. Uh, how much time do I have? Oh, good. So now I'm going to now I'm going to throw something in completely different, which is highly kind of uh, which is a lot of fun but speculative. But I want to I will hope to get this in because uh, to hopefully find some more people doing time course type experiments. So we did a, a, a version of IGV to support a specific paper that had uh, a time course of dendritic cells that were somehow, I'm not a biologist, frozen at some state, some quiet state, then hit with a, a, a uh, uh, some kind of, uh, uh, I, I'm obviously, uh, on the biology, I'm, I'm not strong on the details, but it was hit and then measured at four time points. Okay, is that good enough? Um, and this is actually uh, tied to the paper. It's on the web. Uh, I don't seem to have the URL, but I'll give it to you later. But what you can see are um, a combination of peak calls, which can be, by default, are colored by transcription factor. You can also color them, though, by their dynamic properties, how many fold changes they have. So the red ones are changing a lot over the course. The blue are also changing in the negative direction, and the gray are not at all. You can also look at the signals, the wiggle tracks. You can expand the signals to see the time courses. You can filter. Um, so what of interest in this paper was to find the dynamic sites, or, or one part of the paper. You can filter with this uh, slider bar and take off you know, the ones that aren't changing much to get your set down. Okay, very good. So that's been out for a year. Uh, I don't think it gets a lot of hits, but it's out there. Um, so we had this time course data, and recently we said, why don't we try animate it and see what it looks like? And that's what I'm going to show you now. I'll need some help, though. This is another movie. Um, sorry, one more. So um, I'm going to select animate, and there's an uh, awkward uh, delay, which I should have cut out, because it has to load all, the, all four time points. Now it's looping through four time steps. Is that zero, one, two, three? Zero, one, two, three. We can change the peaks, which in some ways uh, is actually much easier to look at. These peaks were also filtered uh, so that we're only seeing the ones that change. Okay, that was fun. Um, well, the, the question is, is it useful? And I don't know. <laughs> but uh, one thing that I found fun was to watch the, pl the poll 2 actually fill in, in time, across this gene. And I'm going to step through it slowly. So we're going to watch that track. This is time zero. This is 30 minutes. That's one hour. Going right to left. This just filling in very nicely. And it backs off for some reason. Another, uh, if you were watching the peak tracks, you might have noticed this peak come on right at the end. And 
Uh, I believe that's IFB1. But if we watch it in the signals, we can kind of see it, but we probably would have missed it if we had just looked at the signals. So I think they're both, if they're useful at all, probably both views are useful. So if you, you're doing time for see me, I'd like to develop this more, but not if there's never going to be another data set. So, um, so I uh, acknowledge the, the rest of the team, uh, Helga Thorvald's daughter and Jacob Soltera. Or the, uh, make up the IGV team. The, the cursor project, uh, the frames I showed at the end, that's a collaboration with the uh, epigenetics group at the Broad, particularly Noam Shores and Bang Wong. And our funding uh, primarily from NIH, but, and also the uh, SAR Cancer Consortium and Stand Up to Cancer. Thank you very much. I have a question here. Um, thanks for that very nice talk. Um, thanks for giving us all an excuse to get the new Mac Pro. Um, I'm sure it'll be great. Um, my, my question is, and this is actually for Paul um, as well. I mean, I notice when we start to kind of federate all these different data sources and we're dragging data from OnCode and, and, and Blueprint conceivably and, and, yeah. and, and, and other IHEC members. Um, I mean, the caveat would be that these are often processed in very different ways. And you know, I'd really hate a graduate student to start basing a year's worth of work on a difference that was really no. artifactual between methods. And, and, and yet we, we have no way of really warning people about what you can compare legitimately and what you really mm. cannot in many ways. I, I don't know whether you or, or, or Paul have any, any ideas around that. Uh. No, I don't. Uh, I mean, it's uh, it's especially a, a, yeah, it's a big problem. I, I was just thinking of the thousand genomes, how um, even the the calls from different centers are totally different, even within one project. So yeah, sorry. I think, sorry. I have nothing to add to that. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big problem. I think an only comment to that, sorry, was like, it's basically we need to encourage people to be open about how they have processed the data, which is not something that we always find on a paper. I mean, papers are very nice, but at the end of the day, somebody will want to use that data again. And it's not, we're not at a point that this is easily done because it's very often that we don't find all the information needed to actually reproduce this kind of um, examples or this kind of uh, results. And then it becomes impossible to compare different data sets. So I think it's mostly that we need to be, start being more open of how do we process the data and then maybe we can reach a point where we can actually integrate them without having these second thoughts of how much they can be integrated.